Welcome back to Business Air TV. We're here at MBAA in Orlando, Florida, right next to the Innovation Zone. And speaking of innovation, I'm here with Eric Cote, the president of Jaunt Air Mobility out of Canada. Thanks so much for being with us. It's my pleasure. So I want to understand uh, how the regulatory environment, how you guys have been able to navigate and uh, transact inside of aviation, both in the U.S., Canada, and abroad. What, what type of what type of hurdles are you facing right now? So we're still in the early days, uh, but you know, specifically in our case, as we will be certifying uh, for Part 29, which is you know the IAS level on the rotorcraft uh, certification. I think that we've put aside some of the challenges that we may hear about from the eVTOL community uh, so far. Uh, one way also for us to mitigate it a little bit is that, you know, what we've seen so far, and, and you know, I think that I may be, you know, not necessarily right about it, but we can feel like there is a lot of pressure on the FAA right now the, by the fact that there are so many people uh, making inquiries and going to the same, uh, you know, uh, area of expertise at the FAA that for us going uh, for a, a certification in Canada with Transport Canada is going to be an enabler. So talk us through where are you in the process right now? Where, where is Jaunt Air Mobility at in the certification process um, on your current airframe and, and how many other iterations of airframes do you guys plan to bring to market in the next few years? Yeah. We have a, a, a demonstrator aircraft that flew uh, 300 hours uh, that was, you know, we were allowed to fly it with a pilot, but we are still in the uh, really early stage of converting that existing aircraft to a full electric aircraft, having, you know, latest and greatest technologies like uh, fly-by wires and using all of the, you know, the new available technology. So how far are you from true commercialization? You know, if we look at the, the work we've done in the past eight to ten years, we actually bought the IP from a previous company, Carter Aviation. So uh, all the work they did, you know, we we're piggyback, big, piggybacking it on it. So the, the 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 data that we've had to translate it into a new aircraft will allow us to go straight from not a. We won't go for a prototype, then a pre-production. We will go straight to. We will have a, an aircraft in between, you know, a full-scale model, then go to the pre-production aircraft. We will certify that pre-production aircraft and commercialize it. What we see right now is a lot of, you know, aircraft flying, but if you look carefully, these are all unmanned. Uh, so I would consider them as what we did with our, you know, uh, grounded aircraft that we have right now. So they are still in that process. So sometimes you may feel like it's tomorrow, but it's not, you know. Uh, we, we think that, you know, the first commercial flight will happen in 2026, 2027, which is the date that we maintain since the beginning. So timeline is five years to kind of clarify. You're thinking five years before commercial viability. Is that, do you find that in the entire eVTOL market or do you think that that is just for your business? Do you think there's somebody else that's going to get to market faster than five years from yeah, now? Yeah, we think that it's a little bit optimistic to go and certify and commercialize with dates that we hear like as early as 2025. Uh, because as of today, you know, you need to have certified systems. Even if you've got an aircraft ready, you need to have the motor certified, you need to have the avionics, you need to have all of that certified for aviation, which is also something that takes time. We think that, you know, within the next few years, some components will be almost on the shelf. So electric motor will eventually become like a commodity. So at that time, yes, I think the rest will evolve pretty fast. But until we get, you know, the major system certified uh, or ready to be uh, used for uh, aviation, I think that this will be a challenge. Social acceptability, I think that we will go through that. Uh, as long as we've got good players around the table, which I think we have right now, the uh, ecosystem is, 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 is good. There's a lot of money flowing on the market. Uh, a lot of learning also is happening. So it's, it's good for everybody. Uh, but we don't think that we, we think, we still think that we will be among the first being in early 27. And do you think that making the move to Canada is going to give you a distinct advantage over some of your competitors? 
I have to say yes. I think that, uh, and we see every, every, almost every two weeks, we see a new engineering um, company coming to Canada and to Montreal uh, in the eVTOL market. So I think that they see that there's a, there's, a, there's a pool of talent there, a lot of expertise, a lot of available infrastructures also. So do you have, is, is there a core of skilled talent in Canada that exists now in the eVTOL market? Or are you having to retrain some of that labor pool? No, definitely we need to retrain. Uh, but as this is, I would say, a sexy new segment of market, a lot of interest into it. The new, you know, young engineers uh, are really looking into that. And one differentiator that we have in Quebec is that we also have all that electrification of transport cluster, which you don't have in uh, Seattle, which you don't have in Toulouse in France, but we do have it in Canada. Going from the minerals that you would find in the, you know, in the ground to make full battery pack up to delivering aircraft. So we have all of that in the same, and honestly in the same physical location, you know, in the province of Quebec. So this brings a lot of tier one and tier two suppliers to be al already existing and evolving to that new um, market. Yeah, absolutely. Shifting gears just a little bit, a lot of our audience uh, is in the capital allocation space and is looking at making their next bet uh, on one of these companies. How do you see, there, a lot of companies are spacking and going public and you know, aviation is uh, arguably over-indexed for some of that fundraising activity. How are you guys thinking about increasing your runway to get to that commercial viability. Um, do you need to raise money? Is that something that's going to be on the table for you? Do you have any plans to go public? Yes, definitely that, you know, we've seen the SPAC craziness a year and a half ago. So a lot of companies went from one day to the other, like fully funded. Um, we, we didn't consider the SPAC version of it, uh, funding, uh, but going, you know, for some other uh, sources, we're looking, we're still looking for, you know, uh, for partners. We are still at the at the stage where we can we still have some flexibility to get some uh, equity in the company. So this is definitely some an area you know. Uh, but we want to have good partners. We want have we don't want to have people that will put money into it and have high expectation. This is at the end. This is it looks like automotive, but it's it's a aircraft business. You know, it takes time. So you don't have a return within two years, three years. So it's a long term investment. And if we find the right partners, we still have room for that. Definitely, this is... It is arguably speculative as well, right? There is a lot of unknowns. The FAA could decide, no, we're not going to allow you to certify, and that five-year return window now becomes a 10-year return window. Yes. And I, I wonder if the market actually prices that in when you talk about fundraising. Yeah, this is, we think that we are a safer bet because of our Part 29 certification, which is using something that exists uh, and you know, we didn't talk about it, but on the safety uh, side of it, this is also where, you know, some, some designs uh, are questionable. Some of them are pretty good, but still have to. But if I talk for our own, you know, we have full auto rotation capabilities. We have a fixed wing on top of that. So at the end of the day, this is probably safer than a helicopter and safer than an aircraft. So that will put more chances on our side, making less speculative. Uh, but some other designs which are new, if they have no way of being able to control or if they lose full power on the aircraft, uh, using a ballistic parachute uh, may be a challenge. So in the eyes of the investors, that is something that we think some of them may not have considered yet. You know, I fly helicopters and sometimes I'm afraid that, you know, something may happen. But in, with that specific design, the fact that, you know, we have a main rotor, but we also have a fixed wing. If I lose the main rotor, I can still glide, you know, and if I lose the wing, I can still auto-rotate. So in, in that sense, some of the model, you know, I can make my iPhone fly. If I put a motor on it, it will fly. But if I get rid of it, if I lose power, I'm done. So I need some alternative. So until we get that under control, because a lot of, there is a lot of resistance on the market right now because people would not want to install a ballistic parachute because of the weight. It, and so if you install the parachute, all the, the um, equipment related to it, you will probably have one or two passengers less that you can carry. Which also impacts that commercial viability part Absolutely. that we talked about earlier. Absolutely, you cannot make it uh, an economical uh, business case if you only fly two passengers at a time. So you know that the break, 
even point is at least you need to have four. You, you mentioned earlier that you are a helicopter pilot. What's the most unique place you've flown your helicopter in? Oh, up north in Canada, going yeah. fishing in the remote areas. And this is, uh, you know, you can land, it's uh, freedom. So if you had to advocate for more people owning their own personal helicopter, uh, what would you tell them? Don't come to Canada because I won't be alone. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, this has been great. Thanks so much for coming on the program. And very I nice really day. appreciate it. Best of luck in the future and enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you very much. We'll be right back from Business Air TV at NBAA.